Shalana and everybody for coming out tonight. I really appreciate uh, the effort and thank yourselves uh, for coming here as well. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my spiritual journey, I don't want to say it started back in 2012 because I, I believe we've always been on the spiritual journey. But uh, the shift, big shift for me happened back in 2012 after a very emotional, uh, dramatic experience. I decided to quit a corporate job and I moved to Thailand. And after that, it was Korea for a year. And that was kind of my cocoon period. And that's where I actually started questioning life and religion and spirituality. And it led me to uh, self-educate myself more on spirit, the spirit, spiritual path and uh, different religions and spiritual teachings. And I uh, actually planned a trip to Peru in early 2014, where I had the privilege to work with uh, Mother Ayahuasca for three weeks. Uh, had no contact with anyone for three weeks. Uh, strict vegan dieta, and I drank ayahuasca with that neshama nine times. And that's actually the first time in my entire life that I experienced self-love. And self-love is really love for, for everything and everyone. So after that, uh, it's been up and down, but at least I know now that's what life is about. It's about the ups and the downs, and um, everything in between is what makes it really worth it. I am a yoga teacher, and it's quite interesting how I've landed on the Ayurveda path. Uh, never really thought of, I, I, you learn about Ayurveda when you do your yoga teacher training, and it's quite interesting because um, yoga has been so westernized and it's, everybody has a yoga book or writing books about yoga, but not all yoga books talk about Ayurveda, but every Ayurveda book mentions yoga. It's such a big part of the practice actually. Um, anyway, so let's get into it. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ayurveda, oh, how I got onto the Ayurveda path. I was actually traveling to India last year in December to uh, get more teaching hours for uh, my yoga teacher training and ended up at a Ayurvedic retreat center in the south of India in Kerala, uh, where I was privileged enough to meet Janesh Vaidya, who's an international, um, internationally known uh, Ayurvedic practitioner, and he's also a well-known author about this subject, uh, very well known in Sweden, so most of his books are in Swedish, but he does have some books that are translated in English. I will, at the end of this uh, lecture, also give you all of the information about his retreat center. And uh, I had uh, opportunity to work uh, closely with the Ayurvedic doctor and to formulate uh, individual um, yoga programs for people who ha and their specific mind-body constitution. But let me tell you more about that. Okay, so the history and philosophy of Ayurveda, it's an ancient system of life knowledge arising in India thousands of years ago. And the Ayurveda theory evolved from a deep understanding of creation. The great Hindu sages, the monks of ancient India, came to understand creation through deep meditation and other spiritual practices. So they were actually just looking for a way to preserve the body longer so that they can go into deeper meditation and connect spiritually more. They observed the fundamentals of life organized them into an elaborate system and compiled India's philosophical and spiritual text called Veda or knowledge. Ayurveda was first recorded in the Vedas, which is known as the world's oldest existing literature. So yoga and Ayurveda has a lot in common with the Hindu beliefs, purely because um, in Hinduism they don't acknowledge one god specifically, but lots of gods, and you're not worship, worshipping the god outside of yourself, but the gods are merely just manifestations of your own own consciousness. So you're not separate from those experiences. The wisdom of Ayurveda is recorded in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is the ancient language of India, one of the oldest languages in the world. Ayurveda teaches a series of conceptual systems characterized by balance and disorder, health and disease. Disease and health results from the interconnectedness between the self, 
personality and everything that occurs in the mental, emotional and spiritual being. To be healthy, harmony must exist between the purpose for healing, thoughts, feelings and physical action. So what is Ayurveda? The Sanskrit word Ayurveda can be broken up into Aya and Veda. Aya meaning life and Veda means science or knowledge. But this self-knowledge is incomplete if we are not familiar with the anatomy of the brain. So you can ask yourself, are you the servant or are you the boss of the brain? Stress, anxiety, anger and sadness has an obvious effect on the body. We all know that stress can cause cancer cells to, to accumulate uh, or it makes you feel sick when you feel depressed, you feel sluggish. It has a whole effect on your whole entire being. Continuous mind-body yoga exercises and balanced lifestyle improves how you handle life situations. So first of all, I just want to make something clear. Yoga is not just a physical practice. Yoga is a Sanskrit word that means to yoke or to come together. So let's, for example, say that your individual spirit, your Atman, is a drop of water and the ocean is the universal power or God or whatever you want to call that. You are still part of that because you're still a drop of the water in the ocean. When we practice yoga, you are practicing to merge with the ocean. So you're practicing to merge with your universal power or with God or whatever you want to call that. I'll go a little bit into the history of yoga as well. Yoga comes, the, the oldest book of yoga was found in Kashmir and it was called the Bhairav, sorry, Vigyan Bhairav Tantra, which is also a Sanskrit word which means the book of secrets. Now, in this book, it's basically a dialogue between Shiva and his beloved Shakti. Shiva resembles the masculine entity or energy, and uh, Shakti is the feminine entity. In this dialogue, Shiva is asking Shakti all of these questions about how to attain yoga or become enlightened or how to have peace. And he's answering her back with all these um, techniques on meditation, lifestyle, astrology, numerology, mathematics, all of these knowledge, he's answering her back. And the legend has it, as Shiva was telling, telling him, telling her all this knowledge, the snake around his neck was <laughs> listening into the conversation and later reincarnated into Patanjali. So if you are practicing yoga, you'll be familiar with Patanjali, which is known as the grandfather of yoga. It's, it's quite unsure as if Patanjali was one person or lots of sages and saints that actually accumulated into this knowledge to formulate the book that we know as the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. But Patanjali left, left behind an eight-limb yoga path, uh, which is just basically eight steps that will help you to attain yoga or to samadhi or to connect with your higher source. So the first two limbs are basically ethical disciplines, how you treat the outside world, your, your relationship with the outside world, for example, uh, non-harming, that's where the vegetarian diet comes into, and how you treat other people. The second limb is um, your, in, your independent uh, discipline, so that's where meditation or uh, chanting or your personal spiritual practice comes in. Third only comes asana practice, which is your yoga postures. So yoga does not just mean going to the gym and doing some stretches. That's actually just a part of that. So with continuous mind-body yoga exercises and a balanced lifestyle, you can improve your how you handle difficult life situations. But different seasons in our life are necessary for our spiritual growth. I think this is quite important seeing as lots of uh, spiritual texts only speak about the spiritual experience. They don't really speak about the human experience. But we were born into our human bodies to have the human experience. So it's good to have a positive mindset and to try to, to stay positive. But if an emotion pops up because of a certain season in your life, if you are feeling sad or depressed or angry, it's good to also fully feel the emotion, nurture it, don't judge yourself because by becoming aware of the emotion, you're still practicing awareness, you're still practicing consciousness. You don't need to judge yourself because you're having a negative emotion, it's what part of make, what makes you human. 
And as healers and teachers, I'm sure there's uh, lots of uh, teachers or uh, who, who, here is here, we need to be really honest to our students about, about these different seasons in our life and tell them to fully um, surrender to the moment and hold space for yourself when you are feeling sad or depressed or angry. Because at the end of the day, we are born in this world alone and we die alone as well. Okay, so let's consider that everything has spirit. Our souls are actual travelers experiencing this world through different bodies. The soul derives from the universal power and enters the world through the door we call the uterus, seed or egg. So again, I'll take the example of water. Let's say the universal power is a cloud in the sky and when it rains, the raindrop derives from the cloud. So your Atman or individual soul derives from the cloud and enters this world for whatever experience you are having. A soul enters into life at the time of conception and grows inside the uterus, seed or egg until the time is right to come out. Time of conception and time of death is decided by the universal power and its calculations that we call astrology. A soul comes out of the uterus as a child with a physical and a mental body to start its journey on this planet. During the time of growth, the soul experiences different stages of life as it passes through childhood and adulthood. Finally, the soul travels through old age and exits from the present body through the door of death. And according to Vedic scriptures, after death, the soul continues its journey through a tunnel which leads to a uterus at the other end and where the soul continues its life to experience through another body. When the soul enters this life, it generates two bodies for functions, the physical body and the mental body. The physical body is the body that you see here. It's the one that can be perceived by the five senses, smell, taste, sight, hearing and touch. The mental body can only be perceived with the sixth sense and is invisible to the other five senses. Through scientific equipment, we can only measure the imbalances of the physical body. But according to Ayurvedic principles, any health-related treatment practice without considering the imbalance of the mental body is incomplete, which makes totally sense if you think about it. When studying our health, we cannot separate or avoid the natural connection between the body, mind, and the soul. By understanding Ayurveda, we can rethink and reschedule our lifestyle to enjoy it the most. All living species on this planet are intelligent and have a healthy awareness about nature. So let's consider nature. They have learned Ayurveda, the knowledge of life, directly from nature, not from the university, universities or books. We need to consider that all living species have the same right to live a complete life on this earth as we humans have. Nature has the complete power to create maintain and destroy everything on this planet. And that is the basic principle of Ayurveda. Nature has the complete power to create, maintain and destroy. Through the universal power, everything recycles and repeats in nature. Day and night, changes in season, birth and death. The soul spirit residing in a body is an invisible energy which enables nature to create, maintain and destroy every cell in the body. So that is the soul and everything around us. Ayurveda explains these three elementary terms as vata, pitta and kapha. And they, these are the three doshas. A dosha is one of the three bio elements that make up one's constitution. These teachings are also known as the tree dosha theory. The three bio elements are always fluctuating in the body, always unstable, and changes with day, night, age, food, and of course your mood. The central concept of Ayurveda medicine is based on the theory that health exists when there is a balance between the three doshas. Kapha. Kapha denotes the water element, and that is the creator of every cell in the human body. It is also earth if you consider that most of the earth is actually water. P 
Peta denotes the fire element, and its main function is to maintain the body cells. Vata denotes the air element, that is the destroyer of cells. And you might think why this is necessary. Of course it is necessary, because when it destroys, in turn it helps Kapha to replace new cells in the body as well. In Hindu scriptures, these three elements are connected to the three supreme gods. Brahma, which is the creator, related to Kapha. Vishnu, the maintainer, which is related to Pita. And Shiva, the des destroyer, which is related to Vata. And this just goes to show how much medical practices and spiritual practices were connected in ancient India. The unique combination of these three doshas or the four elements in each individual has a specific influence on our physical, mental and emotional tendencies. Determining which dosha or doshas are dominant can help you to make the right diet and lifestyle choices that will maintain, balance and promote health and well-being on all levels. Okay, so we're quickly going to look at them. The vata dosha would be energy that controls bodily functions associated with, with motion. Think about air, so everything that's moving. When something dies, you need, to, you need the air to blow it away in turn to create something new. So blood circulation, breathing, blinking, and your heartbeat, all the moving. When it's in balance, there is creativity and vitality, and out of balance, it can produ produce fear and anxiety. The pita dosha is energy that controls the body's metabol metabolic systems, including digestion, absorption, nutrition, and your body's temperature. Fire keeps something going. When it's in balance, it leads to contentment and intelligence, and out of balance, it can cause ulcers and anger. And the kapha dosha, energy that controls growth, because water makes something grow. It supplies water to all body parts, moisturizes the skin, and maintains the immune system. When in balance, it is expressed as love and forgiveness, and out of balance, it can lead to insecurity and envy. Each person has all three doshas, but usually one or two are dominant. Various dosha proportions determine one's physiological and personality traits, as well as general likes and dislikes. Okay, so let's, for example, say you have a predominant vata type. What are the characteristics of that? Uh, predominant vata types are creative, quick to learn and grasp new knowledge, but also quick to forget. S uh, slender built, usually tall, fast walker, tendency toward cold hands and feet, discomfort in cold weather. Excitable, lively, fun personality, changeable moods, irregular daily routine, high energy in short bursts, tendency to tie easily and to overexert, full of joy and enthusiasm when in balance, response to stress with fear, worry and anxiety, especially when out of balance, tendency to act on impulse, often have racing disjointed thoughts, which also leads to problems with sleeping, and generally have dry skin and dry hair and don't perspire much. Characteristics of Peter predominant types. Usually have a medium physique or strong well built, sharp mind, good concentration powers, orderly, focused, assertive, self-confident, entrepreneurial at their best, Aggressive, demanding, pushy when out of balance. Competitive, enjoys challenges. Passionate and romantic. Strong digestion, strong appetite, gets irritated if they have to miss or wait for a meal. When under stress, Peters become irritated and angry. Skin is usually fair or reddish, often with freckles, sunburn easily. So when pita element gets very high, that's usually how the Ayurvedic doctors can see there's redness on the skin. Perspire a lot, uh, good public speakers, generally good management and leadership ability, subject to temper, tantrums, impatience, and anger. 
And typical physical problems include rashes or inflammations of the skin, acne, boils, skin cancers, ulcers, heartburn, acid stomach, insomnia, dry or burning eyes. So this will be when the pizza element gets too high. Characteristics of cough are predominant types. Easygoing, relaxed, slow paced, affectionate and loving, forgiving, faithful, compassionate, non-judgmental nature, stable and reliable, physically strong and usually have a sturdy, heavier build, have the most energy of all constitutions but is, but is steady and enduring, Slow speech, reflecting a deliberate thought process. Slower to learn, but outstanding long-term memory. Soft hair and skin. Tendency to have large, soft eyes and a low, soft voice. Tend toward being overweight. Sluggish digestion. Prone to depression. Gentle and essentially undemanding approach to life. Can be very calm strive to maintain harmony and peace in their surroundings, not easily upset and can be a point of stability for others, tend to be possessive and hold on to things, don't like cold, damp weather, and physical problems include colds and congestion, sinus headaches, resp respiratory problems, including asthma and allergies. So that was just a, a little bit of the big picture. There's lots more with it and like I've mentioned you can have one or two predominant dosha types and what that basically means is there's too much of the element in the system. How to determine your type? First of all there are um, different websites or books that you can use. Uh, the three, the first one is quite easy to use uh, where you have a questionnaire uh, which is usually multi-choice and then so it, it can kind of tell you which ones are more dominant. Uh, or if you're really lucky, you can travel to South India and find an Ayurvedic doctor who can look at you for, speak to you to tw with you 20 minutes, they just look at your breathing, ask you a few questions about your past, and they can tell you, okay, you have to work on pita or vata. But anyway, for us out here in the first world, we can use the internet. Okay. Just keep in mind that shorter questionnaires will give a more generalized result. So um, I, would, I would recommend maybe doing a few questionnaires or doing a longer one. The first one I've mentioned, the first website is, is quite nice. Um, but also your body changes with age, seasons and life situations. So the result will change as well. So that's again where you need to do the work. We can't just expect someone to tell us, okay, you need to work on this and they give you everything you need. You have to do the work. So it's a good idea to maybe keep a journal and say, okay, you're doing your questionnaires now. This is the dosha types that you need to work on. And it also helps you to self-reflect. And then after, let's say, two or three months, you can take the test again and see how you've improved. Okay, so working with your predominant type. So just to, to clear this out, how you will know is they'll probably tell you, okay, you'll do your questionnaire and they'll tell you, okay, you are PETA. That means that predominant you PETA, so it, it means that your PETA type tends to get too high. So now you need to follow a yoga program or exercise program that will lessen the PETA, a, a lifestyle that will lessen PETA, so your diet that will lessen PETA, and there's also um, meditations that you need to do to lessen the PETA element. Journaling, like I've just said, to self-reflect. It's also useful to use the chakras. If you are familiar with the chakras, you would also know that the chakras are related to the elements. So you would know if, if, if you have some elements that are out of balance there. Um, there are very useful um, information on the internet, which can also tell you a little bit more about the chakras. And observe. Become more aware and conscious of yourself as a whole but don't judge yourself. As I mentioned again, if you feel that there's lots of negativity going on inside of you, you're still becoming aware of the negativity. So don't judge yourself. Don't be so negative. Don't be so negative. You'll be like, okay, I'm negative. I need to work on this. Or maybe this is just something that you need to go through right now. Hold space for yourself in, which every season you, in whichever season you are in your life and build on that relationship. One of the the, the most 
it's probably the biggest lesson I've learned when I lived in India because I was completely isolated for like almost six months um, is that it, you need to be there for yourself because if there is a conscious awareness that is there seeing that this person is feeling a certain emotion feeling a little bit unsure having self-doubt or self whatever you are going through there is an observer that is bigger than you and you are a part of that like I just said you are the Atman you are a drop of the water but you're still part of the ocean you can't help others if you can't help yourself first okay so let's just have, have some general health tips for Vata types Vata was the first one that I just mentioned slender uh, slender build um, just physically and the creative ones maintain regular habits try to eat and sleep at the same time every night this is important again because they tend to get uh, too um, too underweight so they forget to eat because the thought processes are just too hectic uh, so it's a, it's very important to not skip meals choose foods that are warm cooked nourishing and easy to digest um, because they're working about uh, working about blowing away and getting rid of things so it can also lead to constipation sweet berries fruits small beans rice and all nuts and organic dairy products are a good choice for vata types these are really just a few there are so much more add more warming spices like cinnamon cloves and ginger to your food uh, this prevents digestion issues that vata types tend to get as well as anxiety dry skin or insomnia uh, avoid icy drinks exercise intensity should be moderate not too much and not too little but more meditative uh, so you'd rather do a slow paced hatha style yoga or yin yoga uh, tai chi or walking and swimming are all good avoid strenuous activities and again when vata increases too much it can lead to extreme weight loss uh, this, these are your overthinkers creative minds struggle to sleep and uh, that usually also has a, it, 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 it tends that the fire goes down so that's what leads to digestive issues general health tips for PETA types the natural leaders the enthusiasts keep cool avoid overexposure to direct sunlight avoid fried and spicy foods because there's a lot of heat and fire already in your system avoid alcohol tobacco overworking and overeating practice meditation or grounding seated yoga postures are really good uh, because uh, if the pita gets too high they tend to get very aggravated and irritated and the breathing is a lot up here um, susceptible to feeling negative emotions like hostility hatred intolerance and jealousy fresh vegetables and fruits that are watery and sweet especially cherries mangoes cucumbers watermelon and avocado have lots of salads with dark greens such as spinach and kale very important to avoid conflicts cultivate the virtues of honesty morality kindness generosity and self-control and it's very important for pita types to, to eat first thing in the morning even if it's just half of a banana before an exercise and to eat regular meals because there's a lot of fire going on there's lots of work going in the digestive system it can tend to overeating if they if you skip a meal and uh, don't overdo it with exercise your pita types are usually the ones that want to go and run a 10k and they they really like all up here they need to calm it down a little bit general health tips for kapha types the last one be active on a daily basis as kapha types are prone to sluggishness depression and being overweight get out of the house and seek new experiences this is very important traveling is very good for kapha types try to be more receptive to change foods that are light warm and spiced dry ginger and lemon is a great pick-me-up for kaffas avoid heavy oily and processed sugars so heavy meals I'd stay away from that use lots of spices such as black pepper ginger cumin chili and lots of bitter dark greens high intensity exercise is recommended to rid excess water that makes sense because when you do high intensity exercise you tend to sweat more and if you high in kapha you have more water in the body 
So standing yoga, yoga poses and intense vinyasa flow would be quite good, or Bikram yoga, hot yoga is quite good. And it's better for kapha types to eat breakfast a little bit later in the morning and also to try to keep the breakfast nice and light, so maybe a smoothie or a juice or a light fruit salad because they tend to feel very heavy. So it's nice to get, keep it light. Okay, so general tips for all doshas. Understand your unique mind, body type, and the specific needs that derive from it. That's where the work comes in again. So you need to self-reflect. You need to find out what your personal uh, needs are. Because Ayurveda is really in a person personalized approach to health. And knowing your mind, body type allows you to make optimal choices about diet, exercise, supplements, and all other aspects of your life. Eat a colorful, flavorful diet, and food should be prepared and eaten with awareness. At the retreat that I stayed at, um, Janesh would not let us eat and speak. So when you go and you eat, you don't speak. You sit in front of your food, and you take one or two minutes to meditate or pray or just give thanks to your food, really appreciating where the food came from, who plucked the seed, the whole process of making this beautiful thing in front of you that's going to come into your body and nourish every cell. And I mean, how many of us eat in front of the television or the computer? I'm also a little bit guilty, but very guilty. But <laughs> uh, it's, it's a very good practice to have is to eat with awareness. And then include the six Ayurvedic tastes, uh, which are sweet, salty, sour, pungent, bitter, and astringent. And this was basically because Ayurvedic, Ayurveda is such an old medicine, they did not have anything to test uh, what nutrients are in certain types of food, so they added the six Ayurvedic tastes to ensure that you get all of the nutrition that you need in your meal. Uh, when you include all six tastes, you will also notice that you feel satisfied and the urge to snack and overeat will diminish. Okay, I'm just quickly going to go through the general, uh, the six Ayurvedic tastes. The first one is sweet. Those are your grains, pastas, rice, bread, starchy vegetables, dairy, coconut sugar, honey or molasses. Um, and it has a soothing effect on the body and it builds body mass. So when you have a increased kapha, which will help you to build up your body mass, you will not eat too much sweet. If you have a very increased kapha, you would stay away from all of those food sources. Uh, but it is um, good for vata and pizza. So if you want to increase vata or pizza, you would include those uh, foods in your meal. Sour would be citrus fruits, berries, tomatoes, pickled foods, and salad dressing. This stimulates appetite and aids digestion. So this is very good for vata, since vata kind of are prone to skip more meals or forget to eat. But uh, if, it, if it's too much, then it can increase pita or kapha. So you would stay away from that then. Salty would be your table salt, soy sauce, or seaweeds. And this enhances appetite and also makes our food taste better. Just be very careful for iodized table salt. So go rather for the Himalayan pink salts. Uh, this balances vata. So if you have low vata, you want to increase vata, you would use this lowest. If you want to lower vata, you would eat more salt. But because salt makes the body retain water, if you have high kapha, you would stay away from too much salt. Pungent is your peppers, chilies, onions, garlic, cayenne, uh, black pepper, cloves, ginger, mustard, or salsa. Promotes sweating and clean sinus passages. So obviously, when you have too much kapha, you have too much water, so you would eat more of these kind of foods too, less in kapha. But if you take in too much of these foods, it will increase vata and pita. So, whoa. Bitter is your green leafy vegetables, green and yellow vegetables, kale, celery, broccoli, sprouts, and beets. This detoxifies the system. Very good for kapha and pita that's increased because it lowers that. But excessive intake can aggravate vata and actually make a person who has increased vata um, lose too much weight. 
Astringent would be lentils, dried beans, green apples, grape skins, cauliflower, pomegranates and tea. Uh, this balances kapha and pita, but too much can increase the vata. Okay, so this is just a very little of lots of lots of other food choices. This is not only what you can eat, but it's just giving you a general idea. Okay, so Sleeping is also very important in the Ayurvedic principle because um, sleep is really the nursemaid to humanity. Lack of restful sleep disrupts the body's balance, weakens our immune system and speeds up our aging process. Recommended is six to eight hours of peaceful sleep at night. And this does not include taking a pharmaceutical or alcohol to help you to go to rest. It is six or eight hours of in uninterrupted natural rest. And if you do have trouble with sleeping, there are natural alternatives like chamomile works very well or yoga nidra works very well as well. Now, yoga nidra is also a form of, of yoga. You can go look up. There's lots of uh, things that you can listen to on the internet. And uh, you would know that you haven't had a restful sleep when you feel tired or unenthusiastic. Un Live in tune with nature. Basically, this means that having healthy desires match what you actually need. As nature made you, what you need and what you want should be, shouldn't be in conflict. When you're in balance, you naturally desire only that which nurtures your health and life. And that's again where the self-work comes in, the self-reflecting comes in. You can't just expect... <laughs> You can't just expect that you are here and you learn, you're watching this PowerPoint presentation about Ayurveda or you buy an Ayurvedic book and you read about Ayurveda. It, it can be about anything really and just expect it to do the magic for you. Everyone who's worked with plant medicines also know that you can't just drink something and expect it's going to change you. You need to do the work. So you need to do the work and, and you would know because when your desires, when you feel like binging on sweets or junk food or when you feel like going and drinking or going out doing bad things to your body, that obviously means that you are not in balance. So you need to self-reflect. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Did you, did you find, did you find, yeah, any questions so far? Yes. What about sleeping too much? That's also not good. Sleeping too much, not good. I won't say, I would say not longer than eight hours. Afternoon naps? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. What can pita tats do to uh, sort of calm down the energy if they're too hyperactive? So I would really recommend, recommend yin yoga. I don't know if you're familiar with yin yoga. So that's more of a meditative style of yoga where the yoga postures are actually kept for a longer time because pita predominant types tend to breathe too much too fast. Um, a lot of people that um, have predominant um, pizza type would say that they have feel shortness of breath sometimes because of stress or anxiety. They feel they, they, they want to do more than they actually can do. So that's really great because it also calms down the breath breathing is yoga, um, what did I say, yin yoga, uh, or gentle walks and meditation. Meditation, very good, yeah. Any other questions so far? We're on the sleep power slide. Yes. Um, I think I think I'm a, a Vata. Sorry. Okay. I thought I was Vata too, but oh, no. So yeah. <laughs> I'm eating exactly what I shouldn't be eating, and I love exactly what I shouldn't love. And is that normal, or do you think I might? Well, uh, what what I would recommend is everything in moderation. Like it's it's very hard to to keep 
book of what you eat all the time. But as long as your food is nutritious and um, healthy, and if it includes those five or the six uh, tastes that I told you about, that should be fine, but in very little moderation. And you can actually look at the foods that will decrease vata. You can add a little bit of that to your diet. What I would recommend is um, finding a suitable book. The your book, uh, the one that you read, did it give um, a questionnaire? And also the food types. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just, after this, I'll give some recommendations of books that will give you the types of food that you can include in your diet that will bring down the vata. Because obviously it means if you think you're predominant vata, your vata element is too high, so you need to get that down a little bit more. Yeah. But yeah, just try to eat everything in moderation. So the only thing that's about chili, like the chili. Yeah, but ch too much chili is not good for the chakras as well. You don't want to stay chili in very little moderation. Like even working with the um, with the South American plants, you're not allowed to eat chili in preparation. So. No, I, I love chili too, but <laughs> very little chili. <laughs> I've heard that um, in Ayurveda, when you eat your dessert first. Uh, well, fruits, fruits should be eaten first thing in the morning, yes. Yes, it digests the fastest, so that's the healthiest, yes. When you eat your sweet on your plate? Sweet on your plate? Um, yes, but the, they usually include the fruits and everything together, but, and you can mix it up if you want to. Uh, but if, if you're eating it in one sitting, it really doesn't matter that much because everything goes down. But it would be smarter to take the fruit first because it digests faster. So, yeah. Okay. You flow in harmony with your body's natural rhythms, getting restful sleep, feeding your senses with experiences, tastes, touch, aromas, sounds, and sights that uplift and nourish you. When you slip out of tune with nature, your desires become non-nurturing, like I've mentioned, and you may crave junk food, neglect to sleep and exercise, and indulge in compulsive behaviors. Look, like I just said, that we do go through different seasons in our life, and this is completely normal. We do go through dips, we do go through challenges, but also that's necessary because, like life and death, the one cannot exist without the other. You cannot tell me that this was the most amazing experience you've ever had if you, if you haven't experienced the polar opposite, right? So, but over time, a little imbalance if you don't observe or get more or self-reflect enough, if you just decide to leave it, it can become a disorder and then disease. And this brings on more stress and neglect and this is when you get really sick or when serious things start to happen. Self-reflecting by journaling, uh, meditation, spending time in nature and our own spiritual practices help us to thrive more on what our bodies need for optimal health. And it's also important to surround yourself with like-minded people so that you can talk about these things when they do arise. Okay, so uh, just to finish off, I want to talk about strengthening your digestive power because good health is dependent upon our capability to fully metabolize the, nut the nutritional, emotional, and sensory information that we ingest. Agni or fire is our digestive energy. When agony is strong, we create healthy tissues, eliminate waste products efficiently, and produce a subtle essence called ojas. Ojas means bodily strength, which is the source of our vitality and the basis for clarity or perception, physical strength and immunity. If agony is weakened, our digestive energy, Digestion is incomplete and leads to an accumulation of toxic residue known as AMA. The buildup of AMA leads to obstructions in the flow of energy, information and nourishment and is the basis of all disease. And this is basically your solar plexus. We all know how horrible it is if we have problems here. It's also called the Manipura Chakra, which is basically your relationship with yourself or your ego or your human experience. 
Here are some Ayurvedic practices to strengthen your digestive fire. Sit down to eat. Don't eat in front of the computer or TV or while driving. Eat in a settled atmosphere and not when you're upset. Listen to your body. So eat when you feel hungry and stop when you're full. Small portions are better than huge portions that make you feel sluggish and is also not good for your small stomach. Try to include all six tastes in each meal. Drink hot water with lemon and ginger in the morning. You can also use tea. Uh, there are actually specific teas for the different uh, predominant dosha types, which you are welcome to go look up. And uh, in Ayurvedic treatments, they use lots of oil massages because it also works with the meridians. Uh, and all these herbal oils are also, they're different, sorry, they're different oils. There are different oils for the different predominant dosha types that you can use. So it's good to, um, to go for massages or maybe you can do self-massage as well. I'll, I'll mention the website at the end that actually have some tutorials on self-massaging. Spend time with yourself in nature through spiritual practice or meditation and use detoxifying herbs such as uh, Drupala, Asvagandha, Brahmi, Ginger, Turmeric and Neem and relax. The Ayurvedic approach is about allying with the infinite organizing power of nature rather than struggling or trying to force things to go your way. When you observe nature you will notice that grass doesn't grow, it doesn't try to grow, it just grows. Birds don't try to fly, just fly. And flowers don't try to blossom, they just blossom. Nature functions with effortless ease. It is intuitive and nourishing, like our Atman, like ourselves. You will expend least effort when your actions are motivated by love because nature is held together by the energy of love. When you chase after status, money or power, you waste energy. But when your actions are motivated by love, your energy expands and accumulates. So take it easy and be guided by love. And um, just, I was just thinking about your question earlier. I, I don't want to say, like, I think a lot of it goes in with, goes with intention. When you are preparing a meal, if there is love and good intent in your meal, if you know and you're conscious about, I really encourage a vegetarian diet as well, because if you are conscious of what is on your plate, that it's good energy, it's good and nourishing to your soul, then that makes also a very big difference in what you eat and how it affects your body and all the cells in your body. Okay, um, the, there are just some of my resources. Um, the books that you can get, uh, uh, there are different books that you can find on Amazon, but these are the ones that I'm aware of. The first one I have is uh, What Are You Hungry For? from Deepak Chopra. And um, Ageless Body, Timeless Minds, also a great read. And then Perfect Health, The Complete Body Guide was actually recommended by a friend. And then Dr. David Frawley is like the grandfather of Ayurveda. Um, his books are, are, are quite informative, quite heavy to read, but very, um, very knowledgeable. Um, I have the one yoga and Ayurveda, and then I've also been recommended that nature's medicine is a great one to use. And then Janesh Vaidya is, was my teacher, um, and he's got uh, one English book that's called Ayurveda for Your Mind, which you can uh, order on his website. And then also yoga is my therapy, but we're still waiting for the English translation. And then a uh, good website to use is the Chopra Center, which is amazing for also for these uh, self-questionnaires and tips on Ayurveda, tips on cooking and food. Uh, or you can go to Jadanesh Vedia's home website. Or if you want to travel to India and try a retreat, you're welcome to go to the retreat that I worked at, which is the Vedas Ayurveda Village. And yes. That's it. Thank you very much. Um.